Fisher here in Chevy Chase. I live in the Hawthorne section in Barnaby Woods. It is part of my territory as well. Um, this is my first year term as chair, so I'm very excited to be serving you all, the entire city, and especially our neighborhood of Greater Chevy Chase. Thank you for coming tonight. I want to especially thank Mayor Bowser. I am extremely grateful for your service to our city and for coming to ANT 34G to talk about your 24 budget. I'm very appreciative of your time. So with that, we will have a pretty tight run of show. We're going to start with commissioner introductions. And again, my name is Lisa Gore. I'm single member district 34G01, which is Hawthorne and Barnaby Woods, so closer to Rock Creek Park. Um, my district runs from Western Avenue, Oregon Avenue, past Pinehurst Circle, Beach Street, and back on up to Western. Thank you for coming. Mr. Gotchel. Hi, I'm Peter Gotchel. Or G06, which is the west side of uh, Connecticut, back and forth, Second Street, into the western and military peninsula, east of the bottom, of the military in the bottom, of the military implication. Um, thank you for being here, Mayor. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Commissioner Zelda. Chevy Chase. As I was sitting here, as I've done many, many times before, I realized that I've represented Chevy Chase for 16 years. Uh, eight years as your council member uh, for Ward 4 for part of Chevy Chase. Uh, in the last eight years as your mayor. And so it has been my great privilege to serve you. Uh, and I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for your good ideas, for your trust, for your tough questions, uh, and for making sure that we're working together uh, as a government to make our city work for all eight wards. I also want to thank the, the commissioners present uh, and thank you for your invitation and everybody listening. And I do thank you for being in person uh, so that we can get together uh, and talk about the issues that affect our city. I also want to recognize members of my team uh, who are here. If you're a Bowser administration representative, would you please stand? 
Uh, we're joined by the city administrator for the district, Kevin Donahue, uh, who's here, the DPW director, Spriggs, the DPR di director, Thinny Freeman, uh, Michelle Yan, representing um, the deputy mayor for education, Sharon Hines, the director of the DC office of, uh, the DC Department of Aging and Community Leading, Living, Sharon Kirschbaum from DDOT, the Deputy Chancellor Amy Mastera, uh, and no offense, but your mokers are also here. I also see Phil Thomas, the Office of the Clean City. Uh, so the Ward 3 moker, Matthew Barclay. The Ward 4 mokers, uh, Sophia Tokala and Derek Johnson. So please give them a big round of applause. So thank you everybody. Uh, for being here. Uh, so I'll say a few things because it looks like there are some questions uh, it, about the FY24 budget. Uh, and as you know, uh, we submitted our 28th balanced budget to the Council of the District of Columbia a few weeks ago. Uh, the Council works on the budget for 70 days. They have hearings, and at the end of that time, they will approve uh, for the district a balanced budget as well. I mentioned uh, in my budget presentation some of the headwinds that are facing the city all at the same time, coming out of COVID, uh, reacting and dealing with a new uh, state of work uh, with remote work and its impact on our city uh, and making sure that all of the recessionary trends that we see in the economy are also affecting us while we're dealing with increased cost. Everybody knows that story because you're dealing with it in your own household. Getting the same thing costs more um, with the level of inflation uh, that we are experiencing. While at the same time, our revenues have actually, for the first time since I've been serving in office for 15 years, we've seen our revenues dip, largely because of um, the effects of the pandemic and remote work. So these, this is the budget um, that we go into this with. I go into it with the same values. How can uh, we invest in the things that mean the most to our city, to bring our city back um, from COVID and fully open our city and make sure that our, our economy thrives again? So that's what this budget is about. How do we make those investments most strategically uh, while delivering our services and while serving residents across all eight wards? So uh, part of what you'll see in here is my continued commitment to the affordable housing promises that we've made. Uh, but you also see uh, th that commitment moderated by our present time. Uh, I pledged when I ran for mayor eight, nine years ago that we would spend $100 million every year from our housing production trust fund. And I've been able to keep that promise and do it even more. Uh, in the last two years, actually in part of the COVID years, we were able to increase that investment to over $400 million per year. So we've done over a billion dollars uh, from our housing uh, production trust fund alone to create more affordable housing across the district. And when I think about the threats to the district and how we grow, uh, before COVID, hands down, the biggest threat to how our city would go, grow and be competitive was affordability, single biggest threat. So we're competing uh, with the surrounding jurisdictions to some extent, but we're also competing against jurisdictions throughout the country uh, where housing typically is more affordable. So being focused on our affordability is how we will continue to have a thriving economy uh, and make sure we can make the types of investments that we want to see in our infrastructure. We've also been very, very focused on how we're making investments in our, our public housing stock. You'll see $115 million proposed in my budget, um, but also how we're keeping dollars in DC residents' pockets. So we have an innovative new program that we introduced here to eliminate $90 million of medical debt for DC residents. 
by making a $900,000 investment. So we're leveraging $900,000 to put $90 million in DC residents' pockets. That's gonna affect 90,000 people uh, in Washington. Uh, we are making similar strides in child care, especially for middle income folks. So you will hear me say, you heard me say when I was your council member and I continue to say as your mayor, we, yes, the government of course makes investments in our most vulnerable residents, but we also have to invest in our middle income residents as well to retain and attract more middle income residents. So we are very proud of our pre-K three and four program that is free universally for kids in Washington, DC. And that program continues to allow us to attract and retain families. We know too in this pandemic shown a, a huge light on, on childcare and how we have to have childcare available around the city that is affordable and that is high quality. So we continue to make available a tax credit for families of $1,000 a year uh, that have their kids in licensed childcare in the district. And with this budget, we propose making more DC families eligible going from 250% of the poverty line to 300%. Uh, so fully 43% of children in DC who are between the ages of zero and six years old can have subsidized childcare in Washington, DC. And we know that's how we keep and retain families. We're also living up uh, to a commitment we made uh, in supporting this ANC as well in transforming these facilities here uh, and making sure that as we do it, we add more housing in the District of Columbia. So that proposal, is uh, to renovate the Chevy Chase Library and this recreation center uh, to do exactly that. Additionally, we make an investment of $2.6 million to renovate affordable housing uh, at the Regency House, which is for seniors who are living in Ward 3. So having said all of that, uh, I say, with much optimism, but not blind optimism, knowing how this government works and knowing where we're going, uh, that our finances are strong, we're strong as a city, but we have to do some things differently, uh, especially fiscally, and making sure that, and this is what we repeat in, in our team, is that we have to focus on the basics and make sure we're getting the basics right look at programs that we've invested in previously and make sure they're working or we get rid of them and pair them back. We're looking very closely at the people on that, that work for us, 37,000 strong, and making sure that they're all occupied on the things that are gonna you know, make our services better. Uh, and we've done very little new spending. So when a mayor says that, that there's very little new spending, take her seriously. And that's what I asked the council to do. So now that they have the opportunity to work on it, they can take my recommend recommendations, council member Fruman, and just vote yes. <laughs> that is possible. They can take my recommendations and make a few changes. That is also possible. What I've asked them not to do is say, you know, Bowser, we wanna create a whole lot of new programs and we're gonna raise the people's taxes to do it. I asked them not to do that. Now is not the time, we don't need it, and it will not allow the city to come back in the way that we need to come back. I mean that for businesses, but I especially mean it um, for DC residents and your property taxes. So that's, that's what I've asked the council to do. I've also asked them to look at what we did and not create a lot of new programs. Let's focus on the programs that we've already invested in and make sure they are working for the people of the District of Columbia. Now, I'm also proud, I hope you read the news today. I know you're peeled to the Washington Post like me on some days. Uh, and we have some really good news in the public schools.
Uh, first, we were the first in the region to reopen our schools to in-person learning coming out of the pandemic in the entire region, and we are proud of that. And now what we showed in this most recent lottery that people sign up for where they live, the number of people who signed up went up, I think, 5%. And the number of families that matched to their first choice was at 74%, the highest since we've been doing the lottery. So we feel very good about that. So the last thing um, that I will mention um, is our historic investment in schools over the last eight years, including this budget uh, where we made our already um, really, really well compensated teaching staff even better compensated and supported by, um, by the district. And I say that with pride for a reason, uh, because we know excellent schools, you know, they start and end with excellent teachers and great leaders in, their, in the principles. Uh, we've done over $10 billion of work over the last 15 years in making our building state of the art. Uh, we continue to do that work, though in Ward 3, we're almost done. Uh, we have, we're talking about uh, some, some work that we're going to do on a new high school if there are questions about that. Uh, but I want to say the investments that we've made in our schools has just been tremendous. Uh, when I was your council member, we had a little project uh, called Expanding Lafayette Elementary School. And we made it really big. And guess what? It's full. So we know that there's great learning happening at that school. People move to this neighborhood for that school. Uh, and we want to do everything to continue to make it uh, a premier uh, school program in Washington, DC. So with that, that's our budget. Those are the highlights. Um, I know that there are probably some specific answers. I didn't get into talking about um, the investments, what we consider our back to basics investments in transportation and public safety, but I'm happy to take any questions about that. No. <laughs> okay. That's my answer. Yes. No, it's not going to be zeroed out. Well, let me try another question. Okay. Well, it's a, it was a yes or no question. This is a. Many of us depend on our cars to get to the restaurants and stores here on the avenue and to get to this community center. Um, is the city prepared to pay for underground parking so that you can make maximum use of the Well, we are, we're at the beginning of that discussion, um, and I think it's, it's certainly worthwhile if that is like if you put that on the top of your list as what you want to get out of this development, then it, it should be on, on the list. 
Um, I would ask the commission to weigh in on it, that there are some times when we are trying to maximize the use of a public site. Some people argue um, that overbuilding parking is problematic. Now, getting it right, yes, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a one-to-one -one parking space for every person. Uh, so we should, we should get it right. Now, here's the trade-off. The more parking you build, underground parking is pretty expensive. We built a lot of underground parking in War Three, I will say, um, but it, it gets pretty expensive. So that may be less affordability. That may be less in terms of the, the other amenities that are on the site. So let me say a little bit more about your question, because if, if I'm hearing you, um, and we ha we've had this experience in the most recent budget, things that we budgeted, and often these capital projects are budgeted three or four years, and they don't start, you know, once I put in the budget like this, I think, I don't remember when I first put this one in the budget, but maybe four years ago. Uh, and when it comes time to deliver the project, costs have gone up especially now costs have gone up. Uh, and so what we do uh, when we know we're getting close to either letting a contract or getting close to build, we, we have a term we use, we call it plus it up. So we make sure that the plan that we committed to uh, can be built. And then we go back in a later budget and make sure it's plus up. You know, Michael, I'm sorry that you all are still dealing with this. Um, it either should have been done um, when the school renovation happened or when the community center itself had happened. Um, many years ago, when the playground was redone, I think it was recognized that it was a problem then. Now I'm going back. I'm going back a little ways now. Um, and I believe that it was going to be handled with the construction of the new center. Uh, so now that it's still not done, we really need to make sure we know what the problem is. I understand that there is a pretty, you know, reasonable estimate to get it done at $1.5 million. So may I um, kind of invite you to come in with us, get to the bottom of what we think the problem is, and then we'll work on a timeline to fix it. You got it. That's aligning. I said, sorry, thank you very much for that invitation and I'd like to attend with friends of Latvia for group because they're the ones who are really doing this deal uh, in the absence of any uh, money from any of the volunteers. Michael, and also involved the lighting, which was disconnected when they built the school and was able to put that and it's become a very dangerous situation. Correct. On the baseball field? On the upper oh, field, there okay. Lights. They're there, but there is no wiring to light the lights. Yeah, so that, that, that is part of what I think is a comprehensive review of what's going on. Okay, you got it. said uh, the new budget uh, has some issues that the local campaign has identified. I want to just touch on three of them. There is no new funding for the first time in any of your budgets for more permanent supportive housing vouchers, which is one of the primary ways we deal with uh, chronic homelessness. Uh, there is nothing to deal with a problem that Serious one going from getting people, giving people vouchers to actually getting them into an apartment. There's some bottlenecks there, uh, and it's not going to be solved without some money and some energy, from what I understand. There's, there's nothing in the budget, from what I understand, to do that. And finally, uh, the council passed uh, legislation for 10 new public restrooms in the city. 
funding for any of this in your budget going forward? Okay, uh, let me start with uh, PSA, the Permanent Supportive Housing Vouchers. And Kevin, if you could be on deck to um, fill in some of these numbers. But three years ago, um, the council, you may remember, raised taxes. They raised income taxes to fund vouchers. At the time, we told them, you're funding more vouchers than we will ever be able to get out in a cycle, or two. So there was just really a glut of permanent of vouchers that could be used for very low income housing that our system just can't process that quickly. So we didn't add any more because we have we have a good stock to go through um, to get them. And so you may say, well, people need housing. Why aren't you just handing them out? I think you know well, it's not that simple. Um, that we have people with a, a lot of challenges to housing. You don't end up living on the street because like, you don't have a lot of issues to deal with that are co-occurring and are, are tough. I tell, when I tell you this is one of the toughest issues that I've dealt with in government, it is, it's hard. Um, so we can get people into housing who are willing to work with us and we can put them in the, the right housing situation. When you don't have the right coordination, you can also create a new problem someplace else of too many people with vouchers and not enough services. So we, can't, we cannot do it too fast. So you ask about no new money to deal with the bottlenecks. Um, let me address some new money that's there because the bottleneck is having um, our, our case workers who can work with our, po our very challenged population, work with landlords, work with utility prize, work with credit repair people, work with identity people, work with people to get furniture, do all of those things. Um, and deal with, uh, with these vouchers um, that we advised at the time would likely not get used in the same budget year that they were allocated. So that's why you don't see any new ones um, because we have ones that we're working with. Dealing with the hiring, uh, I am proposing in this budget $2.5 million to create a pot of incentive money. Uh, that we think will work like what we've done for MPD. Uh, MPD now uh, we offer a $20,000 signing bonus, uh, now 25,000 through the end of this fiscal year. Uh, in this $2.5 million pot, other agencies who have hard to fill positions will be able to create their own incentive programs. On the matter of public restrooms, I don't think this, this was one item that was new that we didn't fund but the council has an opportunity to do it. This is what I tell the council members all the time. Like there's, a, and I was on the council so I can say this. Uh, there are like, I have a stack of what uh, what we called, what are this called when they're not funded? Subject to appropriations. So this is what you can do when you're in the council. You can pass a bill, you know it costs something, but you identify no way to pay for it. So it's the law, but it's subject to become the law when it's appropriated. So there's many things that I can do when, in my proposal, but the, they can do, you know, they can fund all of their proposals when they have the budget. Um, yes, yeah. so we've had, since I have been mayor, I created an office for federal and regional affairs. Uh, so I have a group uh, that works with our congresswoman and works with members and have been working with them for the last eight years. Um, and depending on what's going on, uh, we hire additional help. Um, so uh, we had a Republican in the White House, we hired a, a team that helped us with him. Uh, we'll get the right team to help us with this with this new group um, as well, and so that's that's typically how how we do it.
Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor, for coming, Hi. and uh, we really appreciate uh, DDOT's uh, Vision Zero program. Um, we've heard some uh, noises about it not being funded, but uh, up here, uh, we're really looking forward to Connecticut Avenue being safe for bicyclists. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm a survivor of, of uh, hit, and, hit and run on a bicycle, so safety of cyclists is, um, is very important. It's as important as safety for pedestrians and for safety for uh, motorists. So I encourage you to carry on with Vision Zero funded and build those uh, uh, bike lanes on Connecticut Avenue. Okay, thank you. I don't think it's on. I can hear you, but I don't think your mic's on. Or maybe it's not. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Robert Gordon. I'm the president of the Chevy Chase Community Association. We were founded over 120 years ago. Much of our responsibility has been involved with preserving this civic core. Uh, we were instrumental in building the original schools here, uh, expanding schools, uh, expanding schools across the neighborhood. Um, many people, many people are very concerned about the notion of um, surplusing this property. Uh, and you can see there are many people in the back here who are extremely angry uh, we are not racist, we are not NIMBY, we believe in having more affordable housing in Chevy Chase. We think that it is a big mistake to um, excess or surplus property in the heart of Chevy Chase. Uh, it, this land is not very big. Uh, it can afford to have a library, it can afford to have a community center, apartment buildings will take up much more of the green space. And it strikes me that your responsibility uh, is to um, ensure that there are no public purposes for this property uh, before it's surplus. Now, I invite you to take a walk with me. I use this center all the time, and I will show you every square foot of this property that's used for a public purpose. So please, think again about surplusing this property. Uh, we will help you identify an equivalent amount of affordable housing across the neighborhood rather than taking this spot. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you for that question. So let me um, just make sure that let me kind of level set here a little bit. Um, I think you know uh, that the proposal that's also been supported in the neighborhood uh, is to reimagine the site, rebuild a recreation center, rebuild a library, and build housing. So the proposal is not to take away the public uses, but to enhance them um, by uh, more housing opportunities. So that, that's, I don't wanna give anybody the idea that we're just taking the public uses and would not be returning um, the, the public uses. The second thing I wanna say is I wanna talk a little bit about how that process works. It works that way for all of the district's public land, uh, except we have a process in our economic, on our economic development team that we call the OUR RFP. Um, which is a little bit different than some others that we do because we do all of the community engagement at the front. Um, so just as I asked the, the commissioner, like 
what is your priority and how can we include that in the list? And that the community come back, comes back and say, yes, we wanna do this, but we wanna have underground parking. Then we have to think about how that works in the hour RFP. So it's not that I'm writing it or my staff is writing it, but we're talking to, we wanna hear what's important to you um, and we want it included so that the responses that we get back are you know things that we think that you're going to be able to support at the end, so that's that's how the the our RFP works. And then the 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 term that you're using, surplusing, it is we have a process that it goes to the council. We'll make the argument that this is the the public, this is the best and highest use of this public land. And let's face it, it's limited opportunities for affordability in this planning area. I think it's the most limited in the entire city, has the least number of affordable units in the entire city. Um, so we completed a pretty extensive uh, small area review planning period, um, which was good. And actually I had um, a, a resident that lives in another part of the city that was pointing to the Chevy Chase plan as like the gold standard of plans. And that's what she said. Okay, all right. I'll take that as a note. It's not unanimous. But anyway, here is the point that she was making. Let me, let me say the point. And the point that she was making is that in the Chevy Chase plan, that there are recommendations around AMI and affordability that she thought would be good for her own neighborhood. And in the recommendations in the Chevy Chase plan is that uh, the units be built at 80% of the AMI, which for a family of four, I think is like over $100,000. So this is what we're talking about building. We're talking about building housing for our teachers, our firefighters, and other government workers who now can't live in the district. That's what we're talking about building. So if somebody asks you what we wanna do here, we wanna have great public spaces with great housing. Um, that is below market, it's true. But it's for it's middle income housing. No? Okay. Hi, Mayor Bowser. Uh, Christine Davis. It's an honor to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I am actually asking a question about transportation that um, uh, is about basically not parking, but expanded met, uh, metro bus use. We, we had a metro bus that was uh, serving. Uh, my neighborhood, which is Broad Branch Road, called the East Six. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a notice on the East Six bus stop that it was temporarily closed because of the pandemic, which made perfect sense. Um, um, I don't know what happened. Uh, it seems like it just never came back. I don't know if it's going yeah. to come back. I know it's not a purely DC decision. But it, but it would end up, uh, you know, reducing the need for parking if, if there was more expanded bus service. And in yeah. that neighborhood, there really isn't. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to acknowledge um, Deputy Mayor Babers, who also represents us on the Metro Board. I may have a question for you, Lucinda. Um, but I'm going to say something a little bit more broadly about where we are with our, our public transit investments. Um, so you may know that there is a proposal that the council um, voted on, unfunded proposal, um, to make Metro free. You may also know that in my budget proposal, I did something that I thought I didn't really want to do, but the times warranted, is our DC circulator bus, I eliminated half the routes, okay? Because I'm looking at the costs going up, looking at having to build a new garage. I'm looking at this free Metro bus proposal that's out there. Like, so something's got to give. So I made the decision to cut half the DC circulator. Then I'm listening to the Metro GM who sent me a text over the weekend. When can we get together over the drinks to talk about this, this fiscal problem we have? So I'm thinking we have to have drinks. This must really be a, a problem. But here's, here's the deal. 
Oh, throughout the pandemic, there were huge infusions of money that came from the federal government to save transit agencies. And it went directly to them. It didn't even come through the jurisdictions. It went directly to them. That money's running out next year. And so we think that we are gonna have, they are gonna have a cliff of about a quarter of a billion dollars. That's our, that's our portion. So actually it's, it's almost three quarters of a billion dollars and we pay one third. So I got this free metro proposal, which is anywhere between 75 and $100 million and grows every year. And I've got like to eliminate half of our own service. And next year, I'm probably going to have a bill that's t on top of what we already pay, which is significant, another $250 million. So that's a long way for me to say that I'm not supporting any new service because of that situation. And the routes that are underperforming routes that I have fought to keep alive for a long time, including the E6, are vulnerable. They're really vulnerable. Now, here's why I would go to bat for the E6. You've heard me say it here before. We can strand no part of the District of Columbia. And taking away the E6 really strands a portion of our city. So um, that's what we had to focus on, Lucinda and DDOT. Taking away the E6 strands, like many, many parts of Chevy Chase and with no transit connection. Well, thank you for that question. I love questions like that because what I tell people all the time is my job to create opportunity and it's your job to go and get them. And so what we have done with DPR is, and I'm very proud of the work, I've announced to our interim director of DPR is, he is here, Thinny, stand up so people can see you, Thinny Freeman. <laughs> And um, we have made a huge commitment to recreation for all, uh, which also creates amazing, more numerous opportunity for girls um, and boys, but certainly for girls and so some of the underrepresented sports. So, so we'll continue to make that information available. We've added hundreds more camp slots. We created a uh, less chaotic system of how to sign up for camp in the district and people will get their results, I think on April 18th, one of those people. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and so yes, we wanna support um, recreation in, in all ways. Now what the department has done recently um, is uh, announce more partnership opportunities with the community. Sometime, you now obviously we don't have a recreation center on every block, nor should we, um, but we do have some at home recreators um, that have programs. This program may, be, may have been born you know, as a result of somebody who had a great idea, decided to get some space at a local rec, and now you have a 20 year program. We wanna seed other programs like that. What are we calling those grants? Rec for all grants. So they're core grants. They're a little bit sizable. Um, so if you have a great idea to start or you have an existing one, then the department wants to work with you to make, to scale up your program so more kids can take advantage of it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Monica Morin and I live here in Ward 3. And I just want to say that before my question, attending this meeting is a privilege not available to everyone. I want to acknowledge that childcare and service industry jobs often preclude attendance and this kind of civic participation. I want to say that I value all of my housing voucher neighbors because they are less likely to run me over while I'm on my bike. They're less likely to drive a Range Rover or a giant GMC and hit me while I'm stopped waiting for a pedestrian to cross at a crosswalk, which has happened to me on Reservoir Road, hit from behind while stopped for a pedestrian on my bike. 
Um, please work with DDOT to advance the protected bike lane network and don't let DDOT water down any design plans for Connecticut Avenue or K Street. And stop building the you know, transportation network of the past instead of the future. And I just wanna say thank you for your work on affordable housing and dense housing at all price points. We need dense housing to support transit and amenities. On MacArthur Boulevard, the closest metro to my home is Roslyn. Housing and transportation are intertwined and I guess my question is, how do your housing and transportation advisors work together on these intertwined issues? Well, we work together. We work in clusters in DC government and we are, you know, all of our we all of these projects speak to each other as you mentioned and we talk to each other about them our budgeting process is a good way to make sure that everything is lined up um, your city administrator with all the deputy mayors are always talking about their priorities so if it's transportation and it impacts uh, economic development then we're working uh, to, together on those issues so let me just say um, let me say this because there are I've been involved in a lot of economic development projects over my career, and they're always made better by the community input process. It's not always easy, it's not always pleasant. There are a lot of signs, sometimes boos and hisses, um, but at the end of the day, I always feel like the government process is made better, uh, made better by it. So we, we start, and I think that we have a good basis to start here with looking at the small area plan, and I recognize there is that unanimity in what's in it, but it was approved. It was endorsed, then it went to the council and it was approved. And so this is the way that we work together um, as a uh, representative community. The second thing I wanna say about this is about bike lanes. I've been around for the, all of the bike lane wars, even some of the sidewalk wars that started here in Chevy Chase. Um, and there are no easy bike lanes to be done in Washington, D.C. We had some 15 years ago when there weren't any trade-offs. You didn't have to give up any parking. No cars had to slow down. No reversible bike lane. Like, you could just find a place where nothing was happening and build a bike lane. Those days are gone. So if we want to have connectivity in the bike lane, there are trade-offs to be made. Uh, and so where I ask, and you ask me if they're gonna water anything down, nobody's watering anything down, but we do have to make it make sense uh, in terms of the trade-offs, okay? And so that's parking, that's how you get access to businesses, that's how people with mobility issues can cross the street and be safe, it's all of those things. So that's, that's what my charge to the team is, is to look at where we are be, as we advance in this discussion, in the design discussion. And before the design gets too far, then we have been able to deal uh, with some of the trade-offs. Good evening. Uh, my name Good is, evening, Mayor my name Bowser. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bowser. Oh, sorry. I, go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor Bowser. Good evening. I'm Gail Sonneman. I'm here representing a group, Ward 3 Housing Justice, that wants affordable housing at the WMATA bus garage site in Friendship Heights, both the new bus garage site to be to develop and the current bus garage site. Two great opportunities. My question to you is, will you meet with us, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Have you asked for a meeting? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I was so dramatic. <laughs> yes, I will. Good evening, Mayor Bowser. Uh, yes. A Barnaby resident, or Barnaby Woods resident here. Um, I don't have a question, but I was uh, hoping to ask for your support for uh, something that our ANC is asking for. It's uh, $250,000 to fund uh, stormwater management efforts in Barnaby Woods. It is a relatively uh, small uh, line item when compared to some of the other budget initiatives, but it's one that has a very high impact on the residents there. There's a network of stormwater drains that run under uh, many properties there. Um, it is that network has reached the end of its useful life and is now collapsing and is in bad need of repair and replacement. When, as, when those drains are collapsing or failing, 
it is with catastrophic impacts to some of the to some of the the our our our, our, our neighbors. Uh, those those losses in the form of, of flooding are uninsured, and the residents are unable to um, make the repairs necessary individually. If I if I am suffering a loss due to a failure of the network that occurs not on my property, I'm, I'm powerless to fix it. Th this problem is one that the residents individually are not capable of solving themselves, and um, those types of problems are, are really the reason that we have government in the first place, and so I would ask for uh, your support. Which there. streets are you talking about, sir? In between Arcadia and Worthington. Okay. I'm going to um, ask Deputy Mayor Babers and our team between DC Water and DDOT to have some follow-up with you specifically. I'm, I'm very grateful for okay, that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming, Mayor Bowser. Thank you. My name is John Higgins. I'm a resident of Norwood. I'm here with a bunch of my friends from Melwood. Hi, friends from Melwood. And Nowood. we appreciate your longstanding recognition of and support of our, our community. Uh, I won't belabor the, the E6 bus issue, except I'll ask you to double, to double down on that if you can. Okay. The one there. As far as your budget is concerned, I noticed you have $2.4 million for the Military Road Oregon Beach Multimodal, multimodal Trail. Can you or someone on your staff give us a few more details about that project? Sure, Lucinda, do you know, or Sharon, do you know anything about more? Can you say specifically about what the scope of more military Oregon trail is? Um, I'm sorry, was this, oh, sorry. And was the question about access to the trail or the trail itself? The scope of the project. Um, I actually am not clear on, um, I know there is funding for the trail, but in terms of the timeline, is that the question? Oh. Um, Sharon, I think Kevin wants to speak. Hello, I'm Kevin Donahue. Um, uh, so the, in, the uh, intent of the funding is to have, and this is for design, but the idea of having a protected um, bike lane and walking trail that would connect from Oregon Avenue down um, over to where the intersection is for Beach Drive. Uh, and we work with the federal government to have a matching investment that would allow for sort of there to be that kind of multimodal access that would cover the full span of that valley from Oregon Avenue down to Beach Drive and then back up the east side on military. Uh, the, and again, we have not started design, but the intent is for it to be along the road because of the width of the road uh, would allow for that without necessarily impeding the flow of traffic. Hi, Mayor. Thanks again for all your work to make our roads safer for everybody who's using them, your support for Connecticut Avenue, the Oregon or the Military Road Trail, which is great, the connection to uh, Capitol Crescent on Arizona, all fantastic investments. A um, question for you is about the timeline for some of these projects, right? The most recent DDOT timeline for Connecticut Avenue didn't have it completed until the winter of 2028. So this is close to a decade after the conversations have first started. Right, so I certainly recognize good planning takes yep. some time. It doesn't happen overnight, but close to a decade for one lane really seems like a long period of time. What can we be doing to help speed up high priority projects like this? Well, as I said, the more complicated, the longer they take. And I don't care how passionate you feel about the bike lanes, this is a complicated project. Um, and so I if there are opportunities to shape that timeline, we certainly will. Um, and I think the thing that we can do is get to some consensus and some solutions, solutions oriented conversations about where the gives and takes are um, and kind of get away from where we are right now, which is right here. Because as long as we're like this, it will take longer. Uh, Mayor Bowser, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, during the the entire time you were on the council, the D.C. Council, and yeah. since you've been mayor, you have very kindly uh, advocated for the E6 bus. 
for no residents of Knollwood and throughout Chevy Chase, but particularly for our elderly population, whom you have represented so well. Thank you. We've lost the E6 bus, as you know, and we heard this evening. And I heard what you said, but what can you help us do to restore the E6 bus? I realize this is a WMATA issue, but can, can you help us advocate for the return of the E6 bus? This is what, let me make this commitment now. So what I wanna do is sit down with my DDOT team and the WMATA team and figure out what it is. This is gonna be a money issue. I'm just gonna tell you that now. Like, WMATA is gonna likely say to me, Mayor, this bus, so few people use this bus. And 10 years ago, very few people used it. I have to say, you now people who used it rely on it but not that many people use it. Say again. And then, you know what? You're not wrong, right? You're not wrong. I mean, I, one of my favorite chef... I'm, I'm just getting... Hold up. Listen, guys, I'm just giving you some feedback. I'm not against you. I'm for you, right? And I'm for what you're saying, but what it's going to take for us is I have to look at all of kind of our needs and say is move, removing this bus, did it strand? Like, I don't even know how WMATA did it without being able to have that. Did they have a hearing, do you know? Yeah. This just went away during the pandemic. So they probably didn't follow all of their procedures to shut down service. So let me dig into that a little bit because they, they have to have a hearing, they have to demonstrate certain, what is that, that, that test they have to pass to see um, who's being impacted. Um, and I want to get some additional information from them. Okay. Uh, good evening. Mayor good evening. Uh, I'm Loretta Kieran, and I've lived in Washington almost all my life, which is more than any of you have probably lived here. <laughs> so. I think she needs, just let her, let's let go of the microphone so oh, she can okay. get it closer. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to piggyback on what uh, Mr. Gordon was talking about. Uh, so right off, I'd like to say I am against the proposed surplusing of the Chevy Chase Community Center for the following reasons. Number one, this parcel of land was specifically designated to be for public use. Two, there's nothing in the current zoning that allows for commercial development of the site. Three, affordable housing is already available in Ward 3. Some examples are Friendship Heights, and you even mentioned the Regency House being uh, up for renovation. And there are some rent-controlled apartments on Connecticut Avenue. I personally knew a woman uh, who's now deceased who lived in one. So if you really want to help our community, the people who live here, you can approve adding an extra floor to the community center and put in a senior center for Ward 3 which does not even have one senior center. Ward four, by contrast, has two senior centers and will be adding a third at the Walter Reed uh, complex. Ward three and ward four west of the park together have more seniors than any other ward in the city, yet do not have even, as I repeat again, one senior center. With all due respect, why are we being ignored and neglected? And yes, I know about Iona House. However, as a privately run organization, it does charge for some activities and does not provide as extensive services as Hattie Holmes, which is on Kennedy Street, or Fort Stevens over there off 16th Street, uh, those centers which I have attended. As of now, our ANC has voted against surplusing this site. And the majority of people who actually live here, I believe, are against surplusing. That's the majority. I know there are some who do approve of it. Uh, finally, I hope you will take our concerns seriously and keep this parcel of land for the use of the Chevy Chase Community Center. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, for, thank you for holding this meeting. I think that 
most people here probably are against surplusing if they understand surplusing this property. We're all, on the other hand, we're all for affordable housing in Ward 3 and 4. We completely agree with that, and we want it. But there is no reason why the new residents moving into the Chevy Chase community should be deprived of this Chevy Chase Commons area where we all meet as a community. We should all benefit from this, new and old residents. And there are plenty of other options in this area to create affordable housing. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is Aviv. I, when I'm showing my film across the street, imagining the Indian, three more days. Um, I'm talking on behalf of one of our great civil rights leader, Julian Bond, who lived in our neighborhood. We have a bench outside named after Julian. Could we please name the park at 41st in Livingston after Julian Bond, who personally inspired me to make Rosenwald, was one of the great civil rights leaders and was for statehood for DC. Okay. My name is Patty Myler, and I came for recreation things because I'm the vice president of Friends of Lafayette Park. But I, I want to address the Connecticut Avenue thing. I'm a sixth generation Washingtonian. I've lived in this area my whole life. But my fear is that Connecticut Avenue is a major thoroughfare for leaving the city in an emergency. I lived through the derecho. I lived through the 9-11. And Connecticut Avenue was a parking lot. If we take away two lanes and we have an emergency downtown, where are those people going to go? Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Corinthia Simmons. I'm here with my son. One of the things you mentioned earlier was about how Lafayette has a great school, and I just want to put this out to your administration. If we can strive for a goal to have all our public schools in D.C. to be as great as Lafayette, because I would like for no matter where I live in this city that my son can go to that school and he can have a good education. He's in pre-K three, he currently attends Dorothy Heights. So I'm really excited about the new school, but I would like for us to strive because DC is a great city. We have a lot of resources and I think our schools as a person of a product of a, a public school, I'm from Detroit, I just feel like all our schools in every single ward, one, ward one through ward eight should be as great as Lafayette. And I hope um, your administration can strive um, towards that. Well, don't, yes. Thank you. But I don't want you to misunderstand what I said. Okay, all right. Because that is what we work to make happen every day. Uh, I just drove by your son's school that is being erected as we speak uh, so that he will be going into a, a brand new building if that's where you matriculate at, at Dorothy Height. Uh, I'm also very proud of the pre-K investments um, that, that we've made and also our efforts to address Ward 3 overcrowding. Um, so you will know this, um, that we don't want kids to have to travel all across the city um, because that's the place that their parents think is the only place to get great school because we have great schools in all eight wards. We really do. Um, and so, but parents want to know that they have a great building, great staff, great curriculum, their kids are safe, loved, and challenged. Um, and what we're going to do for them is going to carry them throughout um, the rest of their life. Um, and so what I know is that Folks who are in DC public schools, the parents are, you know, they rate their schools highly, having a good experience. They have the, the, course, um, the courses and curriculum that they want. 
not everywhere that they want. And so that's what we have some work to do on. We're working on our high school experience across all eight wards for sure, um, because we think we, we know that we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, I have advanced, I advanced two new schools for Ward 3 um, over the last several years. Um, we are funding in this budget proposal the new MacArthur, we're calling it MacArthur High School. Um, and so that's there. Uh, we are, we pushed back a little bit several years, uh, construction of a new elementary school uh, for Ward 3. There had been some back and forth among our team and the community about if the, the numbers supported the new elementary school. So we, we think that we are, we're getting there uh, in terms of dealing with some overcrowding. Now, the issue that is going to be looming for schools like Lafayette and some others is they're getting to be so big that they're putting pressure on free pre-K. Um, and so that's uh, another pressure that, that we have to figure out. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. We're going to wrap up. That was perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you.